Hello and welcome back, everybody, to the DanJohnUniversity.com podcast. I'm Dan John. This is episode 232. Welcome. It's great to have you back. Remember, if you have questions, and this is a question and answer podcast, send them to the podcast, and the email address is podcast at DanJohnUniversity.com. Uh, I still get questions in the comments about how to send a, a question into the podcast. Let's review how you do that, folks. You send an email to podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. Uh, each week I sit down, I try to answer all the questions I can, and uh, we've got a good we got a good group today. Uh, it's nice because we have a goblet squad question today. We just don't get very many of those, and I like talking about it. Our first question today is from Blake. Blake, that's a good name. So Blake says this. <clears throat> Wondering if I'll be able to gain some mass with only my kettlebells at home. Well, of course, you can gain mass with only kettlebells. Um, uh, body mass comes from two basic things. What is it? Myofibular hypertrophy and sarcoplasty. Of course, if I'd have paid more attention, I'd remember hypertrophy. There's two kinds. Um, and kettlebells are easy to fulfill that with... Uh, by getting the reps up a little bit, by just training, you know, normally, uh, they're, they're a great tool. Uh, and let's go through some ideas here. We have a busy schedule that revolves around the kids' activities and leaving the house to drive to a gym somewhere isn't a great op option for me. And that's common with a lot of people. Um, I'm 5'11", 190 pounds. I've been wanting to put on some size for a while, but don't have access to a barbell. My kettlebell weights are as falls. <laughs> he's got a 48 kilo well yeah just <clears throat> do a couple hundred presses every you know three days a week with that uh with the 48 kilo bell you should be okay uh, uh 224s and 128 you know it's, it's interesting uh when i looked at your list that's real close to what i had probably my second or third year of kettlebell collections my first kettlebell was a 28 and then I think I was able to match up 24s. And then I got this massive bell that someone wanted to get rid of. And I took it. And uh, then after that, I filled in more appropriate bills, uh, bells for everybody else. So the question is this, you know, how do you build muscle with kettlebells? Well, let me go over this. Uh, and I'll have this in a book soon. But uh, there's basically two things I like to build mass with kettlebells. I like the military press family, and I like the double kettlebell front squat family for building mass. Those of you who listen to the uh, podcast a lot, you know I'm about to say the armor building con uh, complex, but let's just hold on for a second. Mm -hmm. I think one of the best overall bodybuilding exercises you can do are members of the alternate press family. Um, I was just uh, doing an RKC with my good friend Marco, and Marco and I, we were just kind of laughing about how underrated the uh, alternate uh, uh, the alternate press is. Uh, time under tension goes to the roof because you're doing one side at a time. So even though I'm pressing with this hand, my body still has to be uh, alert, alive, on task, locked down, you know. The quads the tight, the glutes tight, the ab wall, you know, uh, solid and constricted. And, uh, constricted, probably. There's probably a better word than that. Uh, there's three kinds of alternate press. The first is the standard, um, and this is this would be more from the dumbbell tradition. Um, I have those books by uh, the Bosco books, which I think are marvelous, by the way, and uh, um, he. He tells us that dreadnought strength is being able to press uh, alternate press 120s, 120 pounds. Uh, I have done that in my life. I've alternate pressed with kettlebells, the, the beasts. I got to tell you, it is, it is harder than you think. So alternate press, you clean the bell here, press, bring it down, press, bring it down. After a while, that for most people I work with, it morphs into the seesaw press. And the seesaw press is I press here, and, and it's as this one's coming down, this one's coming up. So it's more of a seesaw. The third variation is what I call goalposts. And there's real value with the goalpost, especially the, the 
if you really want to drive the tension levels up. So goal post alternate pressed is when you have both arms locked out over your head. You bring one side down, you press it. You bring the other side down when you press it, you know, goal post. Uh, for hypertrophy purposes, they all have a role. Uh, if you just need more stabilization for your overhead work, the goal post is a good thing to add in at a lighter load. Because of the bells you have, I would also suggest you look into uh, a lot of single arm presses. I'll put some programs together in just a second for you. But the single arm press has great value. You have that 28, which is a good size bell. And if you're doing some singles, uh, when I got ready for my first RKC, all I had was a 28. So I did the rite of passage with the 28. Uh, I did the snatch test. Uh, Pavel recommended in the book to do it with an oven mitt. I did the snatch test with an oven mitt and the 28. I got to tell you, folks, when you do that, you have confidence in the snatch test with the 24. Um, so the seesaw press, the alternating press, and the gold post press, uh, I would suggest you play around with them a couple of times and then just say, I like this one. Uh, for me, I like the seesaw press because it's just, I, it, it, it moves a little faster. It's not one, one, two, two. It's got a little bit more of a rhythm to it. But if you need lockout, do the, do the touchdown press. I would recommend, uh, we're going we're to alternate this with the armor building complex, but I would recommend two days a week. And if you work out three days, a week, let's just say Monday, Wednesday, Friday, simplify so week one, Monday and Friday, I would like you to do a hard uh, alternating press and maybe even single press workout. Uh, we'll go through that in just a second. And then following week, that would be the Wednesday workout. Of course, you're gonna combine that with the armor building complex. And uh, I just, when I teach these RKCs now, one of the things uh, we, the, RK, uh, the ABC is our little like graduation workout. And the more I coach it, the more I watch people do it, the more I like it, which is unusual. So it's two double cleans, one press, three front squats. Um, you might be able to do it every 30 seconds on the 30 seconds. So if you have a, you know, if you have a, a, a I think they're called analog clocks now, but we used to call them clocks when I was young. So when the second hand hits noon, you do your set of ABCs. When the second hand hits the six, pardon me, when the, the hand hits the 12, you do 60, uh, 30 seconds. When it hits the six, you do, thir you know, you do it. So every time, every, every half minute, you do the armor building complex. That's probably a little too fast for some people. So you might just want to start with every minute on the minute at first. So every time, you know, and, and try to be real strict about it. If you start at the 12, the next set starts at the 12. The next set starts at the 12. My issue with with the armor building complex, I have a real hard time keeping track of how many I do. So I would really recommend that you always make a little mark to keep count of it. Uh, even when I do that, sometimes I forget to make the mark. Uh, and maybe it's just me. So the ABC, um, on week one, Monday and Friday, you're going to do uh, one of the alternating presses followed by some single work. Wednesday of that week, armor building complex. I'd love to see you build up to, you know, boy, you know, when I say 30 rounds, which is 30 minutes, that's 90 squats. So that's gonna be a hard workout. Week two, you'll do the ABC on Monday and Friday and the alternating press on Wednesday and the single arm work on that Wednesday also. With this program, uh, I, I can see very easily that you'd probably only get 30 minute workouts in. So that's gonna help you, Blake, with your time issues, with your family issues. Um, I'm asking you to give an hour and a half a week to your kettlebells. So now let's get to it itself. Now, because you have the 48, there is one thing we can add, but let's, yeah, let's do it right now. If you feel like doing uh, heavy goblet squats instead of just those double kettlebell front squats, you, those big bells will be nice. Uh, you might even want to do something like this. Uh, in fact, the order you type this up in isn't terrible, but have the 48 here, the 24, the 24, the 28, and maybe do something like this. Uh, try to work up to a set of three with the 48, step over to the 24, a set of three, 
step over the 24, a set of three, step over the 28, a set of three, and just kind of float through that a few times if you don't feel like doing those double kettlebell front squats. Since you have only one 28, one thing you can do in the armor building complex uh, when you start to get, when you start to overpower those 24s is uh, do the uneven style. So you'll have a 28 and a 24 uh, set one, in this example, you'd, I do the 28, two cleans, one press, three front squats here. And then when I put the bells down, I always step to the opposite side, so I have to move the bells on the ground. I think it's safer. And then that set, I'll have the 28 in my right arm. After that set, you just keep flipping and flopping. And it's a good way to keep progressing up. I, I don't know. Uh, I mean, if you could, that'd be pretty impressive. But if you ever do mix the and the ABC complex, the 48 and the 28. Make sure you take a video of that because I think that'd be pretty good, cool, a little cool to watch. It can be that simple. The ABC twice a week, uh, the and matched with the uh, uh, one day a week of doing those alternate presses and some singles. The next week, two uh, alternating press singles days and ABC in the middle. Uh, I think you can get you. If you get your sleep in, which is tough when you have kids, if you can get good nutrition in, and that's very possible to do, I think I think you'll get a lot out of it. I, I like what you have here. This is a good combination of bells. Um, can you build muscle with kettlebells? Yes, you can. When you do the ABC a few times, you you're going to really see how how much volume you can get in a short amount of time. With those alternating uh, press days and the singles. Uh, I would say I wouldn't mind if you kept your sets and reps uh, on the alternating presses at like fives or eights or something like that. So it's one, one, two, two, three, three, four, four, five, five. That's going to be, it's only five reps per side, but it's 10 reps for your whole body. When you move up to eight, again, that's eight reps per side, but it's 16 for the whole body. When you do 10 per side, it's 20. So you will find a weird kind of uh, fatigue buildup when you do the alternating presses. I'd recommend with what you have here, I do the 20, uh, 24s for your alternating presses. When you finish that, do a few heavier sets with the 28 for a while. Um, I wouldn't mind seeing you do, you know, if you do like five rounds of eight on the seesaw press, which is an easy sentence to say, but hard, you know, and if you finish that up, with some, some good practice with a 28, maybe a, a set of two, 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 a set of three, 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 a set of five, 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 and rotate through that, rotate through that two, three, five, two, three, five, two or three total times. Um, I think you're gonna have a pretty good workout. And yes, I do think you can build muscle with kettlebells. Thank you. Very, very fun question and answer. We have a question from Neil. I'm on a slow bulk currently. Everybody I know is on a slow bulk. I guess kind of a joke. Okay, well, but I really don't want to have to actively cut diet later. So then don't do a slow bulk, you know, uh, but let's continue. Is it possible that if I keep eating the same quantity of food, as my body gets bigger, the same quantity of food will turn into a deficit eventually? Hence, doing the cutting for me automatically. <laughs> that's actually um, that's actually a, a, an extremely insightful way to think of this, um, because the answer is yes. Uh, if you are building up lean body mass, if you are adding, let's say in a six month program, you add four pounds of lean body mass, which is reasonable. It's doable. Uh, many of us could do that. Uh, if you're staying at the same calorie level, that extra lean body mass, <laughs> just by sitting in a chair, walking, uh, watching television, that extra lean body mass demands more calories. So what you're saying here, Neil, is true. The issue, of course, is uh, can you do that? And, and, I, and I think it's more than possible. So yes, uh, I remember talking years ago with a bodybuilder friend of mine named Lance. And he said that that was the most difficult thing to dial in as a bodybuilder because you, you fill out all these charts and forms uh, when you're at a certain percent body weight and you, you're estimating your lean body mass. Well, 
as you go through, say, that four or five or six weeks where you're trying to build up some of your weak areas, your body, you know, you're adding more lean body mass. So the calorie numbers actually, you're like you said, Neil, uh, Lance said the same thing. As you get bigger and bigger, your caloric needs kind of expand. But if you choose not to expand with them on paper, on the calculator, reasonably, you would lose body fat. Now, let's go back. Let's get out of the magic fairy land, the, uh, you know, uh, never, 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 never land. And let's come back to, to earth here. Um, there was a lot of ifs in there. And the biggest ifs, of course, on this whole thing is you having the discipline to record your caloric intake in the whole before and after period. I mean, I salute you. I think it's a great idea. I just think it might also be a little difficult. Um, keep an eye on garbage calories as best you can. Uh, those have a way of creeping in. Uh, I don't think it's ever a bad idea to, to have a day where you blow off your diet, uh, Thanksgiving, Christmas, uh, Super Bowl. <laughs> but the problem is most people I now work with have, they, they seem to find every day is a celebration. Uh, I'm still a believer, first the fast, then the feast. And I think that is the best way to go. That what you're going to need to, to be able to have to do is make sure you measure those, those calories now very closely, and then make sure you can check them out later on to see if you're not trending in the wrong direction. Um, this is a time, I'm not a big fan of it when people send me pictures of what they ate. Um, but this would be a good time for you to take maybe a two week period, take a picture of everything you shovel down your throat. And then in six months from now, in a two week picture uh, period, take a picture of everything you eat. That alone might be valuable. Um, you've got to really keep your eye out uh, on uh, liquid calories. Uh, it's not, people think I'm talking about alcoholic beer and stuff there. Obviously beer has its issues, you know, Guinness is rather low, low calorie in comparison, but it's the soft drinks that get you. It's those smoothies get, that get you. It's when you go, you, you know, I don't know why people spend seven, eight dollars on a cup of coffee, but, uh, you know, if you go get yourself one of those fancy cu cups of coffee, you might as well just have a milkshake. I mean, it's the, the calories are enormous. So watch out for liquid calories as you go through this. And then, and then also, um, really keep an eye on what on your cheats, okay? On those little, oh, I'm just gonna have a handful of this or uh, some of that. During those two weeks, take a picture of every handful you eat. That alone might be worth it. <laughs> that might be enough evidence for you to stop doing that. Uh, and it's also, it would be very annoying to be at a party with you where every time you picked up a handful of chips, you took a picture of it. Um, but i tell you one thing, you'd have a nice base of knowledge and information that you can unpack for a while. Good question, I hope that helped. Um, over at the forum, I've had one or two people kind of talk about the same kind of thing. I'll need to go back and, and review it. But, uh, if you're out, if you're over there at the Dan John University forum, put this in and see if anybody else, I, I know there's some other people who are trying to do something similar. Okay. Thank you, Neil. Good question. A uh, very short question. And I appreciate this more than, you know, um, Kevin, he says, what are your thoughts on box jumps? Are they valuable? Any risks? Yeah, yeah, the risks are high. Uh, I banned box job, uh, box jumps at the, at the, at the last full time strength coach job I had. And the reason was we kept getting people to hit the corner. We had wooden boxes and people hit the corners and tear their shins apart. Um, we actually had to have somebody get some stitches on one, one time. Uh, people were losing days and weeks. And I, and I just kept thinking that there's, there's better tools. Having said that. I'm also a track and field coach, and right behind me, right here, is uh, Larry Newth's book, uh, The Triple Jump Encyclopedia, and there's a whole bunch of other track and field books back here that speak highly of uh, plyometrics and box jumps. This comes down to one of those things, Kevin. There's going to be a couple layers of this answer. First off, I mean, it's, I mean, this is just a cost and benefit discussion, isn't it? First, do you need to do them? Do you need to do them? You know, if you're working with, uh, you know, I don't know, typical, you know, typical person in my neighborhood, general population person, uh, 
who sits, their two most common postures are sitting first and then the sleeping, laying down second. Um, having them doing box jumps might not be what they need. They You probably get away with some hip thrusts and uh, six point rocks or something like that to get the to keep the hips mobilized and <laughs> get the explosive work in, in a little bit safer way. The second thing you gotta ask yourself, you know, and this just gets bound to the risk to reward. Um, and I remember years ago, Mike Boyle telling me that he would, wouldn't have his athletes do kettlebell snatches because they all bang their forearm right here and, and beat it up pretty badly. So the kids get these massive bruises. My first thought was, well, you gotta teach it better. But then I listened to what Mike said. He goes, you know, people are paying me money to, to do these things. And he couldn't see the rewards of beating up this kid's wrist here until they figured out how to do it right. I thought, that's a good thing to keep in my back pocket about exercises. There are so many other options to get what you want from box squats. Uh, pardon me, box jumps. I hope I wasn't saying jump, uh, squats the whole time. Box jumps that... You know, you might be able to uh, to mitigate the risks with a better exercise. I was at uh, a gym called IPA this weekend, Ironbound Performance Academy there in New Jersey. Uh, if you're from New Jersey, go say hi to my friend Josh there. Tell him I sent you. Uh, and they have those soft plyo boxes. Now, I think that is maybe a better alternative uh, for a lot of people than the old... Uh, uh, wooden ones you're gonna you're you're not gonna have the issue with uh you know catching the knee and some of the other things uh, when i there used to be a, a great little site called stupid human tricks i don't know if it's still around and i would say you know, when it came into the into the weight room most of the stupid human tricks were people getting hurt on box jumps those soft ones that he has might might answer a lot of those questions i would just say this if you can find a better tool for your client or yourself uh, to get what you want from box jumps, explore that tool. If after you do that and you you know you keep moving ahead and maybe you're you're working with an elite volleyball player uh, who plays a position that demands a certain kind of jumping, then of course you know you put it in. And uh, at the same time, though, I would uh, I would spend some quality video taping of their landing and their jumping. Uh, if you see when they land those knees, <laughs> they land and the knees hit together, uh, stop. Uh, if you see, you know, one foot goes this way, one foot goes, stop. Uh, err on the side of longevity over intensity with any kind of plyometric exercise. Uh, just this morning, I was out in front of my house doing my little uh, uh, plyometric, uh, a part of my grade eight workout. And so when I came in uh, and I first saw this question, my first thought was be, you don't need plyometrics. And then I realized that I do them, but I do them really safely. And that's part of, I think that's part of the big answer here. Kevin, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, I don't know if I answered it like yes or no, because it's not a yes or no answer. It is a, it is, it's a, a, a bit of a spectrum, okay? So you have to just make sure you always put your thinking cap on before you add an exercise, okay? And if you have a better exercise than what you, you know, than that, then maybe you don't need to do the one that you, causes you concerns. Thank you. We now have a question from Justin. Uh, as a person who travels not quite as much as you do, do you have some tips on air travel and how to uh, arrive ready to go? Specifically, do you have a type brand of travel pillow you use? None of them work well. I've spent way too much money and time on them. Uh, I actually, I liked one, but they just didn't work with the Delta uh, headrests, the new ones. Uh, it actually, <laughs> I don't know how safe this was, but it was like a little, uh, like, you know when you uh, hurt your neck and they put that collar on you and then it wrapped around the seat headrest. So on um, the plan was that you would sleep like this and when your head nodded, it would just go like this. Well, when I use a sleep pillow, they don't do anything for me. They, I still just crash. I, I don't, I have yet to find a travel pillow that works. Uh, what I do bring, and uh, in fact, I was on a flight last night, and that's kind of cool. I always bring my music cozy. Uh, it's a head, uh, it's a big 
it's a big, very comfortable eye mask with Bluetooth, Bluetooth speakers here. Now the problem is on planes, the speakers really don't work well enough because of the, all the other noises in the plane, but it really does do what I asked. Um, very often I'll wear a zip up vest on a plane and, uh, with the zip up vest, it's gonna look weird, but so I put the zip up vest about here. And I put my eye mask on here, and it really does, for whatever reason, that combination, maybe because it's keeping the chill out of me, uh, I can sleep with that. Uh, the other thing I often do is I, uh, I purchase really expensive tickets, and so I can lay down and sleep. Um, you're, you're asking a series of questions, I'm gonna answer them, and then I'll come up with a, a, a better answer. Hydration, nutrition tips when in the air. Okay, uh, I can always tell when people don't fly a lot because they'll give me the advice. You just need to drink a lot of water. Okay, drink a lot of water. Drink a half a gallon of water and then have the uh, the, the pilot. I already went into my pilot, but uh, I'm going to need you to uh, fasten your seatbelts as we uh, enter a little bit of turbulence. Uh, flight attendants, please be seated during this time. Uh, I'll let you know when it's uh, clear. So, you have a half a gallon of water in your bladder, and you don't know when you're going to get a chance to go potty. And when you finally do, there's a line seven deep. So, it is it is a balancing issue. Uh, there is a hydration. It's funny. There, there, I do have a hydration trick for you. Mm. Mm -hmm. Nutrition and hydration. Let me get to those in a minute, okay? And then uh, finally, he says, any exercise, yoga, isometric routines you might use when chair bound for the long haul flights? Yeah, I, I don't, I don't exercise. Eh, maybe I'll walk around or something like that. And sometimes I'll, I'll stretch something stiff. But you know, ask any flight attendant. They get very tired of people, you know, when they're doing a hamstring stretch and you're shoving your butt the poor flight attendant's face. Um, that's at least. I wouldn't want that. Uh, when I get off of a flight, I always travel with my uh, Brett Contreras glute loop. And when I get in my room, uh, I lay on the ground and I do my uh, 15, 15, 14, 14 workout. Hip thrust 15, clamshell 15, hip thrust 14, clamshell 14. And I go all the way down to one. And it's hard. And I, I really get... But when I straighten up, I seem better. And then there's an exercise I do. So... First off, hip, uh, hip, hip thrust, clamshell. And then the next exercise I do in basically the same position is I lay on the floor like this and I push my lower back into the ground as hard as I can. Now what's nice is my glutes have already been kind of warmed up, ready to go. I push my lower back in the ground as hard as I can. And then I make this little curl movement up to really make my ab wall get knotted up. So. I call those ab press and curls. When I stand up from there, very often I'll go, ah, it feels good. And I'll hear these cracks in my neck, my back, my shoulder. Uh, that right there, if you could hear it, I mean, because I flew last night, those crack, I don't even know what cracks there. Um, so so for me, get to the whole hotel room, get on the ground and do hip thrust clamshells and then the ab press and curl exercise. I used to do push-ups when I landed, but what I found is, and many of us, even though I think I'm good technically at push-ups, is that because, and if you, this is Yonda's work, but you know, if I've been flying like this, and then if I start doing push-ups, it seems to exacerbate this position. I would say the most important thing for travel is prep. That's why I push sugar-free, orange-flavored Metamucil so much. Uh, your issues when you travel, uh, there is some digestion issues, but elimination becomes a big, 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 big factor. Uh, I would say, well, check it. Lack of elimination becomes a big factor. And then, of course, that often, you know, just shifts right over into diarrhea, um, and that, which is just such a difficult way to go on a trip. You know, first week constipated, second week diarrhea. That was a fun statement. Uh, so I, I like I like to prep up. It's in also in my RKC prep. Start pounding down that Metamucil. Um, I I like before I travel to kind of super hydrate a couple days out. Um, travels hard. Travels hard. 
So if I get the Metamucil and the water in, uh, the morning I get ready to fly, I'm already in a good place. I, if I can get it in, I like to work out before I get on a flight. And then there's this big one that you're missing. Uh, it's how you pack. Uh, so I unpacked today. I was going to say depack, but I think it's unpacked. Uh, I unpacked this morning. And what I noticed was probably half the things that I pack on trips stay in my, my carry-all. I have one piece of luggage when I travel and everything's in there. Uh, I have kind of a permanent medicine kit. I've got everything for both ends of the digestive issues. I do bring a Theraflu with me, the hot drink. Um, I bring, uh, obviously, like painkillers and things like that. Uh, there's this thing called liquid IVs I travel with now, which I think can really help, uh, especially when you're, when you're teaching all day long. Uh, and then the other thing I bring, I also bring a lot of small, uh, those little packs of uh, like instant coffee. They come in these little strip packs like this. I always bring plenty of those because hotels never have enough. Or you go down to the lobby and they charge you eight bucks for a cup of coffee versus, you know, 10 cents for one of those packs. And the other thing I travel with uh, is I travel with uh, ginger tea. I got this from one of my students at uh, St. Mary's. I want to say it was, it might have been Matthew, but uh, I was having real troubles with my stomach and he recommended ginger tea. And now I, I travel all the time with these dried uh, what, instant coffee packs and extra bags of ginger tea. And the ginger tea is my nighttime beverage. Mm. And coffee's my morning beverage. I also think that hot water at night does good things for you. For one thing it does, you know, does help you a little bit with the mucus, which is an issue. And of course, when I'm talking all day at a cert, my voice gets a little ragged, you know. So those help me a lot. Uh, I, I travel with a glute loop. I travel with ginger tea, coffee, medicines. I travel, I have specific jackets that I only wear when I travel. Uh, they roll up really small and they they stay in one place. I always travel with a with a, a swimsuit uh, that would that just stays in there. It doesn't go anywhere. The swimsuits I have can can be used for a workout or for the pool or the ocean or whatever, and it, it doesn't matter. Um, I always travel with a, a, a cold weather beanie and gloves because you just never know. Um, I take my packing very seriously. Uh, I tend to only wear one color, maybe two on trips. You won't be shocked, but usually it's a lot of black. I always try, I used to not do this, but now I always roll up an extra pair of jeans, uh, dungarees as they used to be called. And I do that because uh, you can get away with a lot on a trip, but if you spill, I don't know, if you spill I don't know, uh, chocolate milk on your pants, you, you got to get another pair. Um, that, and, and I like those. Generally, I'll, I'll travel the pair of shoes I'm wearing, the pair of shoes for the gym, the dress your pants for the flight, uh, uh, workout pants and jeans. Uh, and then maybe if I'm in a place four days, I'll bring eight of these shirts. Uh, I'll have a jacket and I can kind of mix and match things a little bit. Even if I'm going to a wedding, the, the additional stuff is just isn't that much. I appreciate that question. I enjoy, uh, I, I do things a little different, but I travel a lot. Uh, I was traveling a quarter million miles a year there, two years in a row. It's eased up in the pandemic, of course. But um, you learn the hard way not to overpack and think things through. Um, yeah, I hope that helped. Thank you. Good question. Fun. So uh, Brian has a question. How would you design a training program for a hypothetical sport which consists of marathon and powerlifting competition done during the same week, weighted in equal proportion. Obviously, there are trade-offs to be made in either direction. Curious how you'd approach it. For context, I'm in my mid-30s, and I've been a distance runner my entire life, but I've taken up strength training and powerlifting the past few years. I realize that it has to be the best at one sport. I'd have to make significant compromises in the other, but that's not my goal. I'd like to be the best I can be, both essentially simultaneously. I'm specifically interested in how you advise balanced running workouts, particularly long runs and gym workouts, today, uh, day to day, week to week, or whatever. Well, I'm not really qualified for this answer, but I know somebody who is. 
He's, he's my one of my great heroes of life. And I've got a yellow tag here for some reason. Percy Sarity. Percy Sarity uh, was this great Australian coach. A lot of people thought he was a nut. Uh, but, you know, what's funny is everything he said is true. He expected his marathoners to be able to bench body weight and double body weight deadlift. So Percy recommended, basically, <laughs> let me give you the answer, Brian. Easy strength and running, okay? So we probably best, I, I would love it if you could do this three days a week. Uh, obviously, the squat and deadlift numbers, are these are just practice sessions, but three days a week, five days a week, do something like three sets of three in the squat, the bench press, and the deadlift. Three sets of three, I would probably use Stephen Quartz numbers, K-O-R-T-E, this uh, West German powerlifting coach, love his work. Um, the idea is that you go in the gym and you take light weights. Uh, he recommend the first week with 58%. You can even go lighter of, of that be your one rep max. But maybe, I don't know, it seems crazy to say, but start off day one with 40%. Uh, I mean, that's light. Uh, three sets of three in the lifts, kind of just feel how they go. After you do the lifts, uh, we'll do a running thing. Uh, the next day, that was too light, go a little heavier. The next day, that was too light, go heavier. And just try to slowly, gently nudge yourself up to loads that you feel like there's no question you could make them. Two things here. No question I can make these lifts today, but also the other four days this week. So get yourself up so that you're greasing the groove, basically, on the bench, the squat, and the deadlift. Three sets of three which is an honest workout, uh, wouldn't take a ton of time, especially with these light weights, and just slowly nudge those numbers up. Um, the problem, of course, it's easier in some ways to, to get those powerlifting numbers up than to get that, that marathon number down. Uh, you're going to have to have a long a, a long route to it. Uh, I still think that for, for a program like this, after you lift... We, let's just say this, five days a week after you lift, you do long, slow distance. Um, somewhere between a half an hour to an hour of running, I just think you have to I've put the time in. And you could probably do that for months. Uh, I love that book uh, from the 70s, Run Gently, Run Long. Now, a lot of people who are in track and field are listening to this saying, that's junk miles, that's garbage miles, there's no value to it. But hold on, we're not just talking about running a marathon. We're also talking about supporting a powerlifting contest also. So by getting those long, gentle runs, and I would even say at Maffetone numbers, so that you can, you know, you should be able to have a conversation with your partner the entire time you're there. You know, hire your kid to ride the bike next to you and talk to them the whole time. Uh, after, a, after a couple of months of just that, it would, of course, be time to change and add a little bit faster work. But almost from the beginning, I would like you to get yourself like, uh, look at the, the local running calendar and there's a 10K coming up in six weeks. Well, on Saturday, you run your 10K, you eat your bagels, you drink all your orange juice, which of course your bagel and orange juice probably do more to damage your, uh, your, your, your system than all the running. And then the next day on, uh, on uh, Sunday, you, you uh, ask a friend to come over and they'll spot you on your squat and your bench, and you're just going to have a low total. What's the heaviest you can go without burning the gasket? Look on the calendar again. There's a 5K coming up. Same thing, a couple of weeks, same thing, try it again. I would love to see you actually practice this sport because I think there's real value in this idea. Uh, I've heard of people doing this, of course. Uh, one of my favorite books of all time is a woman who completely rechanged her life. Her name is Millie Brown, and I like that book very much. Uh, oh, yeah, Low Stress Fitness by Millie Brown. This is my fourth or fifth copy because I keep loaning it out. Um, and it's a very simple book. Uh, she she gets herself in shape for triathlons by using a low-stress approach. Because you're mixing sports, you have to use a low-stress approach. Um, that was something... It took me a while. Now, it's a it's same but different, but just follow what I'm trying to say. When I was preparing for the weight pentathlons uh, years ago, I discovered an interesting thing, and I think it helped me uh, 
you know, do well is that the way pentathlon is five throwing events, discus, shot, hammer, javelin, and 35 pound weight. Well, a lot of people I would, would talk to, they'd say, well, yeah, I do this, I do this, and I do this. So they were almost having five sessions. They would throw discus one day, throw a shot one day, throw a javelin one day. But that's not what the sport is. The sport is in one day, you do all five events. And what I began to notice is when I started training, sometimes it's, it's, it's very time intensive. So I had to think, think around this. Um, where I lived at the time was nice because I had a, 50, a Highland game, 56 pound weight. So I would train my uh, 35 pound weight with the 56. So it didn't go very far and it couldn't take a lot of throws. I trained my javelin with my turbo jab, took, you know, took my throws, got it done. Uh, the shot I would use in the backyard. In fact, I used, to be honest with you, I trained like a Scottish Highland gamer. I threw a BFR, uh, a big rock, uh, to, to practice part of my shot put. And then I, I, I just threw stones in my back. For the hammer, I would sometimes just do drills because I had just thrown the weight. And then on the discus, I would just go in my garage and just do discus drills. But I did all five events. And I think that helped prepare me because it's not one event. It's five, and of course, you talk to a decathlete, they'll say the same thing. You're trying to accrue points. With your sport, I think you need, which I like, you would need to do the running and the lifting sort of combined and to see how it goes. That's my advice, and Brian, I'm sticking to it. And that was a fun intellectual exercise, so I appreciate that. So Hugh has a question, and if you've seen Glass Onion, no, uh, knives out. Everyone's saying, "Hugh, with me." Uh, what's the difference between the side press, bent press, windmill, kettlebell, military press? Um, he says this. I understand this. The side press is a military press with the windmill stretch. Bent press is lifting with the lats. Uh, yeah, well, it's stable. Uh, kettlebell military press uh, lifting with the arm and shoulder. Well, it's really hard to do this talking, and I'm sure the people who are just listening and watching are going, how's he going to do this? The side press, the side press is a little bit farther out than the standard kettlebell press. So let's start with the standard kettlebell military press. We start here. There's a bit of a J angle. You go to vertical, bicep is on the ear, and then you pull it down like you're doing a one-arm pull-up. If you've done correctly, I like the strictness of it. Um, we talked earlier in this podcast about the seesaw press, which I think is a natural way to teach the kettlebell press. The side press tends to be a little bit farther out. I think I think a barbell is a better thing to learn the side press with because you have to kind of balance it on your shoulder here and you hold the mid that some older barbells still had knurling on the midline. Uh, since nobody does one-handed lifts anymore, you're not going to find a quality barbell with <laughs> knurling in the midline. But you, you hang, you, you handle it here, you, you squeeze the lat down, but you still actively push. Now, the bent press is an exercise that I take a lot of time at the RKC2 teaching. What you do is you rest the load on your lat, like you say, with the forearm perpendicular. So it's, it's vertical, it's going towards the ceiling. And what you do is you you push your body away from the bell, the bar, or whatever you're holding. So you don't lift it, you move away from it. You don't lift it, you move away from it. And it's a, a, a specific learning thing. Now on the windmill, which on, uh, it's funny, I, there's two on that list that I really like a lot. That's the military press and the windmill family. The, the windmill, and this is, this, I, this bothers me when people forget this. The windmill starts off with an appropriate hinge. And then you want to turn your, you want to turn your spinal cord. I always tell, I always tell the candidates like it's a plane, a fighter jet rolling over in the sky. You, you want to just take your time that every disc turns just a little bit. So by the time you get through all of them, you have that big, turn in the spinal column. Um, and then what I say is to come out of it, I say unwind and unhinge. 
first a hinge, then the wind. Uh, I think I talk about it in one of my YouTubes. Uh, look up windmill stick, and I think I think you'll get the bulk of it in that one, okay? Um, one of the problems I could see is that if I'm looking at certain books in the Dragon Door publication Empire, certain years, what looks like in from the pictures, some of the pictures, uh, if you didn't tell me what the exercise was, you just showed me one picture, I wouldn't know if it was a side press, bent press, or whatever. But the way we teach things now is, I think, a lot clearer in some ways. And so, so when it comes to the windmill and the bent press, it's hinge. You can do a squatting style of the bent press, but let's not worry about it right now. Hinge, wind, and then in the windmill, you sort of hold it there with the straight arm. And in the bent press, you get in the position and then you sink your body away from the bell. Uh, the ones I would recommend on your list, windmill and militaries. Thank you. Simon asks a question. This is a simple question. Simple Simon. Okay. When performing the gobble squat, a marvelous exercise, how important is to maintain the lumbar region of the spine in a neutral position? So, uh, I haven't had one of these questions in a while, but he's about to mention the butt wink, and I haven't even finished the question, and I know it's coming. Uh, I don't worry about the butt wink as much as a lot of people. Uh, it takes a lot of discipline to clear up the butt wink. And there's also a cost on it for some people is that all that discipline and all that extra time doesn't necessarily trend them towards their goals. They're doing a lot of exercise so they look and, you know, so they, they, they don't squat a certain way. Uh, the bulk of my throwing athletes have it. And it's because they're long. They're long people. My basketball players tend to do it because they're long. Um, when, de when I descend past parallel, I notice that my lumbar region begins to tuck. I've recently heard the term butt wink to explain this. Should I stay within the range of motion that allows me to maintain a neutral spine or descend as far as I am able? I do not exper experience any discomfort uh, when I go past parallel. So, one of the things you'll notice when you work with Olympic lifters, <laughs> you, you never hear people talk about this. When, when I used to clean big weights, bam, that weight would drive my butt to the floor almost. No one cared about whether I butt winked or not. My, I mean, you know, my, my knees would cave in, my knee, my, they would go out. I would twist, like, cause I was trying to make a lift, you know, to win the competition. Um, I don't mind people going deep on goblet squats, even with some butt wink. I don't mind it because the long-term benefits from the mobility and the flexibility and that thing I call anaconda strength at the bottom of the uh, goblet squat, 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 squat is, uh, is, is worth it to me. And, and once again, we get back to this idea that, you know, everything has risks and rewards. I think there's a lot of rewards in doing the deep goblet squat. So I would go past parallel. And remember what I always teach, the goblet squat is not that exercise you see online people doing wrong. The goblet squat is at the bottom, taking your right elbow and pushing your right knee out, taking your left elbow and pushing your left knee out and finding that position. Once you have that skin on skin contact, elbows and knees, then you arch yourself up and that eliminates the butt wink for most people. I and, and back to Simon's question. I have never been able to perform an overhead squat as my upper body begins leaning forward as I descend and subsequently the bar falls forward also. I imagine that this is due to some type of limited mobility. There's your answer. In the T-spine and shoulders. What act, action can I take to begin addressing this issue as I'd love to attain the level of mobility demonstrated in the overhead squat? Well, I have, I have it in the perfect workout. And I also think I have another video. So on here on the YouTube channel, on the YouTube, uh, you know, find out where I have, I think I, I call it the perfect workout, Dan John's perfect workout. And you'll see an exercise there called goblet squat to overhead squat drill. And, uh, I would recommend that. 
Uh, I know I also have an additional video with just that on it. So I think there's great value in uh, doing that drill. You only use a broomstick, or, it, it's not very hard, but boy, can you, you, it'll give you time to get your mobility in. Um, when people tell me that they're stuck with their mobility, very often it's not their T-spine or shoulder mobility issue, it's their hip, well, this, it's this area's issues, not this area's issues. And once they get a little bit more fluid in the goblet squat, they seem to get a lot, this seems to open up also. It is a bit of a push me pull you kind of a thing. You're gonna improve here, you're gonna improve there, you're gonna improve here, you're gonna improve there. Uh, but that's a good question. Uh, if you don't also mind, uh, why don't you uh, send me a video and let's see if there might be something real simple or uh, maybe something you just missed that the, uh, I can help you with or our other viewers can help you with, okay? Well, that was easy today. So there we go. Um, each and every week I sit down and I answer your questions here on my podcast. Uh, again, you have a question, send it to podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. Uh, I'm happy to answer each and every one. This was fun this week. There was a real, a real mix of questions. And I'll be here next week. And until then, let's all keep on lifting and learning. Thank you.